Let us proceed with the game. We're over 2200. The speedrun will end when we're 2300. I do have a plan outlined for after the speedrun. I think I have found a solution which everybody will enjoy. As a sneak preview, there will be indeed another speedrun. I'll continue making these videos. The plan in an idealized scenario is the following. One or two speedrun videos a week, and then heavy emphasis on YouTube-only videos. I really want to push the Endgame series, and I want, to, I want to do a series on basically the lives and best games of a ton of different GMs, while also staying centered on chess instruction. So you've got a lot to look forward to. Let's jump into a speedrun game for now. 15 plus 10. Here we go, guys. Black against player, person 20. Okay, so 1e4. Yeah, well, let's let's play. Mm, let's play e5. Let, let's uh, let's stick to our roots here. Knight f3, knight c6. It's been a while since we played e5, and we're facing the Scotch. We're facing the Scotch. Obviously, the move is e takes d4, and knight takes d4. This is the pure Scotch. Of course, as you might know, white also has the Scotch gambit. That's bishop c4. Uh, and there is the somewhat obscure move c3, but knight takes d4 is the main line. Now here, uh, essentially, black has two moves that are considered to be the main moves. Uh, obviously, they're not the only two moves in the position. They're not, not even the only two viable moves. But these are the two moves that are responsible for like 90% of top-level games. Um, one of them is knight c5. And the move that I have recommended uh, during the speedrun, and I've recommended this to students because I think it's a little bit less theory and knight f6 becomes incredibly messy. If you know anything about the main line, knight f6 leads to very chaotic and very interesting positions, but positions that have to be studied uh, exceedingly carefully, really for, for both sides in order to play it well. I think bishop c5 is a little bit more practical. Now, it's still extremely theoretical. You still have to know a lot. I mean, you have to know a lot to play 1e5, but this is a little bit more manageable. I don't know this line all that well. Uh, I sort of know the basics of it. Does anybody know what Black's main move is here? You basically need to put pressure on the knight on d4. Yeah, queen f6. Because the threat, the threat was knight takes c6, attacking the queen, and then bishop takes c5. Uh, so queen f6 gets out of the purview of the white knight. c3, this is the main continuation. And now we basically develop our pieces. We play the move knight g to e7. Um, we are not afraid of knight takes c6 here because we can grab the bishop on e3 first, threatening mate on f2. That's partially why we put our queen on f6. f takes e3, then we recapture on c6, and obviously we have ruined white's entire pawn structure. So knight takes c6 is a very, very bad move here. White has a couple of ways that they can proceed. Bishop e2, bishop c4, I think is the most popular move. Bishop c4 is on the board. And, um, okay, well, we obviously continue our development. Bishop c4 doesn't change anything about that, so let's castle. Playing pretty quickly thus far, but nothing to write home about. One subtlety we should point out is that if white plays knight takes c6 here, our response has changed. We can no longer take on e3 because the knight would have taken on e7 with check. So there, we would have just taken back with the queen. Black is still completely fine. Now the move is indeed knight e5, as many of you are pointing out. The drawback of developing the bishop to c4 is that it is a vulnerable piece. What is it vulnerable to? Well, it's vulnerable to the centralizing move knight e5. As far as I remember, knight e5 is like the uh, move that is supposed to yield... Uh, the simplest equality. I also know, or I actually seem to remember that uh, Victor Bolagon, who is a uh, grandmaster originally from Moldavia, he wrote a book on 1e5, and I want to say that he recommends b6 here, uh, but I'm not totally positive. Now, d6 would be a serious mistake. d6 is a very tempting move. Who can tell me why d6 isn't good? It doesn't blunder anything, but it it is a serious positional mistake. It cuts off the queen from the knight, which means that white can play knight takes c6. Now, again, we can't take on e3 because the knight takes on e7 with check. But after d6, knight takes c6, knight takes c6, white trades on c5, completely ruining black's queenside pawn structure and giving white a major 
dynamic plus in the center. I want to play Bologon's recommendation here. Let's play the move B6. This will hopefully take our opponent out of theory. Knight E5 is very theoretical, and I don't remember it that well. There's Knight E5 and D5, but I don't remember exactly how to handle that position. So we're going to go with what I know is Victor Bologon's recommendation in his book, which is a move that looks very weird, but if you really think about it, it shouldn't be that weird. We want to develop the bishop, but as we just discussed, the move d6 is a serious positional inaccuracy, so we're circumventing the problem, uh, aiming for the fianchetto without really ruining uh, our pawn structure. And most importantly, if knight takes c6, we preserve the ability to recapture with a queen on c6, supporting the bishop on c5. And also, it doesn't hurt. It most certainly doesn't hurt that the bishop is now uh, anchored by the pawn. So this becomes a little bit less of a headache in general, maybe in the future when the queen is no longer on f6. Uh, this is all I know, by the way. b6 is basically all I know, so we're basically on our own here. I just said the word basically like seven times, and I have no idea why. But in any case, our opponent is finally thinking f4. Okay, I seem to remember that this is the main move. Now let's think. Let's try to understand what our options are. Um, and let's weigh the pros and cons of those options. So I feel like the default option is to play bishop b7, right? I don't see what f4 threatens exactly. A lot of you might be concerned about the move e5, but remember that if there is a bishop on b7, the move e5 comes with a hefty price tag. It opens up the long diagonal for our bishop. Our queen could potentially slide to g6 already creating tons of threats against g2. Although if we calculate a little bit further, bishop b7, e5, queen g6, there is the annoying move f5. So maybe it's more prudent after bishop b7, e5 to tuck the queen away on h6. There, white cannot play f5 because the bishop on e3 hangs. So that seems like one viable option. Um, there's others. We could maybe even consider the move d5 here. After the game, I'll, I'll show you why d5 is a tempting move for me as well. But for the purposes of this game, let's be efficient and let's be straightforward with our developing move, bishop b7. Okay, maybe this is a mistake, but, you know, it is what it is. I think it can't be that bad. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you're just developing your pieces. How terrible can that be? It looks scary, but not really. It doesn't really look all that scary to me. Why? Because we don't have any targets. Right? What you might be seeing is you might be saying, well, this, this looks scary. White's playing e5. He's going to blow us off the board. That's not how chess works. You actually have to have targets and weaknesses for your opponent to blow you off the board. Let's go queen h6 as we discussed. Here, yeah, these pawns look intimidating, but they're also kind of stuck in molasses. And we have a hidden threat. One of the draws of queen h6 is that it sets a hidden threat that's so easy to miss. Who can spot it? Who can spot the threat? Yeah, knight takes e5. Very good. Remember that an x-ray works both ways. When you look at this x-ray, you might say, that's bad for the queen because the bishop's x-raying the queen. Well, two can play at that game. The queen is also x-raying the bishop. The bishop happens to be uh, L, uh, undefended type 1. It's not defended by anything. So knight takes e5 is a threat. Another uh, downside of the move f4 for white is that any time we take on e3 now, it's going to be a check, which potentially is important once again in variations where white wants to consider taking on c6. The move I'm expecting from our opponent, the move that might be the reason bishop b7 is wrong, if it's wrong, is probably queen d2, defending the bishop and setting up the move f5, which if it is played, I... Confess is quite a scary prospect. Um, no, a knight sack on e5 on the previous move. We can talk about this after the game, but it's way premature. White just takes the knight and plays bishop f4, and the quote-unquote initiative is repelled before it even gets off the ground. Yeah, our opponent taking taking uh, his sweet time, his or her sweet time. Now... I have an idea against queen d2. I'm not, I'm not thrilled with that idea, but I feel like it's... I mean, at least it stops at 5. 
Queen e2. Okay, this one I didn't entirely expect, but it makes a lot of sense. It still defends against the bishop, and it actually opens up the d2 square for the knight. So it's a very smart move. Okay, so time to introduce my idea. Basically, to use that word again, <laughs> the battle here rages over control of the f5 square, right? If black can control the f5 square, then we freeze white's kingside pawn play, which is quite a significant asset for us. How do we engineer that situation? Well, in order to control f5, we need to eliminate the knight. What do we take the knight with? Well, taking with the knight makes absolutely no sense. White takes back with a pawn, and the bishop is actually trapped in that resulting position, bishop before a3. So we have to give up our dark squared bishop. That's a big quote-unquote sacrifice, but in return, we get the f5 square. And white is potentially saddled with these pawns, which could be a strength, but it could also end up being a weakness. I think our position is quite tolerable here. Probably not great, but very much tolerable. And if white plays d5, then again, that falls, falls for knight takes d5. I feel like a lot of people here, a lot of good players would play d5 kind of automatically. Let's push the knight away. Anytime a pawn is pushed, you have to evaluate the impact it has on other pawns, on the way stuff is defended. You have to reassess the tactics, which previously didn't work. Which is why in such positions, I'm going to make a bunch of mental notes to myself. And one of them is, always check for knight takes c5. We knew that it was an idea here, right? So this is where I made that mental note. Check for knight takes c5 in every position. Which is what allows me to see this move in the event of d5. And you want to make these mental notes to yourself throughout the game. Like if you see a potential tactical pattern, what people don't understand is it doesn't have to work in the present position. You can still mentally note the pattern to yourself, and then it decreases the possibility that you're going to miss it later on down the line when it actually does work. That's a lot of talk, but hopefully that point is well taken. Uthlanding says, white has two bishops and black has no obvious compensation. Not totally true. Our compensation comes in the form of our light square control, right? You don't have to have compensation for the two, but the, two, the bishop pair isn't an advantage to the point where, like, it's automatically good, like an extra, but it's not an inherently good thing. It's good most of the time, but it's not something that we should really, do, like, cry over. Might c3. Hmm. I don't understand this move. Can't we snag the pawn on d4? Am I missing something? No, we're not missing anything. Knight c takes d4. Notice that I took with a c knight so that the other knight would stay to pressure the bishop. Yeah, our opponent losing the thread there a little bit. We want to quit uh, an important central pawn. And the bonus of this move is that we can support our knight with a move c5. But here we should... We should... Take our time because remember that once your opponent blunders something small, chances are that that's going to be followed by an even bigger blunder. You know that that happens. Mistakes come in pairs as they do here. Queen d2 is just total collapse by our opponent, right? So you say, okay, you have the c2 square for the knight. And if you play knight takes c3, then it's a situation where both knights are threatening to jump to c2 and white cannot capture both knights at the same time. So knight takes c3 is an easy win. And we win a ton of material. Yeah, queen takes c3. And unless I'm missing something, yeah, just knight c2. Just knight c2, easy clap. And all that remains after we win the exchange. Okay, we're just making... Notice that I'm not playing instantly. I'm making sure that there's no, like, crazy attacking options. There are none. We take the exchange. Now, the game isn't totally over. White still has pretty active minor pieces. So you should never assume that Okay, the game is over. You can do whatever you want. You still want to be as accurate as possible. <laughs> People saying white has made in six. Yeah. You know, probably our opponent is considering the move f5, which is no longer scary at all because our queen is now a perfect, perfectly placed defender. So if you're, you know, if you want to take an active role in your opponent's turn, start thinking about what we're going to do after rook takes a1, what is black's top priority? How do we, how do we um, 
not accelerate, but how do we make as efficient as possible the winning the winning process? Well, queen g6, white's not going to yield, right? If you play queen g6, white's going to drop the queen back to f2. And that's going to reinforce the threat of f5. I perfectly like the placement of the queen on h6. It's out of the way. It's out of the way the queen is not vulnerable, and it's putting pressure on f4. It can jump to g6 at any moment. Yeah, d6, right? d6 is a very professional move, because when you're up in exchange, you want to open files. And if we can open the DNE files, what black basically wins the game. I don't know what it is with me in this word today, but... <laughs> Okay, d6. Yeah, d6 is simple and strong. King h8 is, is unnecessary because g7 is not under attack or under any kind of pressure. The easiest is to play d6. This forces at least one file open. <laughs> Hanif says, weak isolated d6 pawn and you as well. Remember, after e takes d6, we're going to take back with the queen. That's what the queen is for. Oh, no, definitely take back with the queen. No, of course, no. Take back with the queen, control the D file. Okay, rookie one. I think a lot of people here would hesitate to take on E5, and rightly so, right? You shouldn't take on E5 immediately because it lets the white rook become active. So let's see. What options are at our disposal? Well, we can definitely play the move rook A, E8 first. But remember that after rook a to e8, we want to take on e5 on the next move. White's going to play f takes e5, and it kind of keeps the center relatively close. Ideally, we would want to get rid of this pawn. Ideally, we would want to get rid of this pawn. So what I'm going to do is actually still play d takes e5. And I hope that our opponent takes back with a rook, which he does, because this will allow me to show that this is a phantom threat. It looks annoying, that rook on e5. But it has no inherent value. It's not threatening anything. Our queen is protecting all of the weak spots on the king side. And all we have to do here is basically... Sm yeah, I, it's, like a, it's like a tick at this point. Uh, is, I don't know if I say that word as regularly in, like regular, you know, in, in most streams. I don't know what it is today in that, you know, in that word. It's just basically inexplicable. So what should we do? We go rook a e8. Yeah, I think I'm just tired. We go rook a e8, we offer the rook trade, and we say, okay, you have an ultimatum. Either you trade rooks or you move your rook away from the e-file, giving us control of the open file. Why did I put that rook on e8 and not the other one? Because I want the other one to be reinforcing the pawn in f7, just in case, just in case. Okay, well, now I'm not satisfied with the placement of our queen. I'm not satisfied with the placement of our queen. The queen could be doing a lot more. Now, what does it need to be doing? Well, it must defend g7, which limits the options to one. But this placement is so much better because we're threatening queen d4 check and we're paving the way for the move h6, which is going to chase the rook away from g5 and give us a little bit more breathing room. h6, queen d4, rook e3. We put our pieces on good squares. Bishop d3. Okay, there, 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 there. Yeah, now I think we have a forced win. We, we have several forced wins, actually. We can start with the move. Well, what should we do? No need to, no need to be defensive. Check. Get on with the business, right? Queen d4, check. Rook e3, game over. Unless, yeah, king h1. There are several ways to end the game. Even, 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 queen takes d3. If you want to be pretty and you want to be accurate, play queen takes d3 because rook takes g7, check. Looks scary. But when you're at this level, you just can't look at a move and say, oh, this looks scary. I'm going to stop calculating, right? No move has inherent, like, a move being scary is not a legitimate reason uh, to not go into it. Because after queen takes d3, rook takes g7, king h8, white has no more checks. Rook g8, rook h7, both are meaningless. And if white takes the queen, then rook e1 is game over. Otherwise, we basically force the queen trade. <laughs> That was th that was deliberate. Easy, basically win. It's a resign time, ladies and gentlemen. It is resign time for White. <laughs> he mouse slips. All right, that'll do it. Queen F one is checkmate. Another one in the can. Let's 
take a quick look at it. This was a relatively short, relatively simple game. Uh, but nonetheless, plenty to talk about, plenty of instructive lessons to take away. And I think that's the attitude that you should always have, right? No matter what game you play, there's something that can be learned from it. There's no such thing as a game that can't be learned from. So the Scotch is still very, very popular. Gary Kasparov was largely responsible for the Scotch being a popular opening at the top level in the 90s. He was essentially the only top player who played the Scotch regularly. And for a very long time, the sort of theoretical dispute consisted in the line knight f6. Here, white plays knight takes c6. Of course, knight c3 is the four knight scotch, which is a significantly quieter opening. But the, the crazy line goes knight c6, bc, white goes e5. Does anybody know what the main line theory is? Knight d5 here is, hint, hint, not the main move. There's a, there's a cool little sequence here. Yeah, queen e7, queen e2. Now black plays knight d5, white plays c4. And another one of those moves now, which you you wouldn't really think of unless you know the theory. And that's bishop c8 to a6. This is like the starting point for a crazy amount of scotch theory. By the way, knight b6 here, I, I have analyzed. And it's a sideline, but I actually think that it might be the simplest way to equalize. Knight b6 and then quickly pushing the d-pawn. So... The reason I don't really recommend this line to beginners and intermediate players is because it's like very heavy on theory and not at all heavy on concepts. You just get like a super irrational position. And, you know, there's all these like weird moves and weird maneuvers. And I just don't feel like it's a great way uh, to to test your knowledge of concepts. It's more about memorization. If you're if you're good with that, then by all means, you can look up this line and you can win a bunch of games with black here. But that's why my recommendation is a far more a uh, straightforward line, which is bishop c5. So here, white has three main lines. You'll remember that xqc against Charlie went c3, queen f6. But the three main lines are knight takes c6, to which black normally responds queen f6. We've had a game like this. There is bishop b3, which happened in the game. And there is knight b3, uh, which was popularized uh, sort of a couple of years ago. I think actually this is where the main theoretical dispute lies these days. Bishop b6, knight c3, knight f6, white plays bishop g5. There was an MVL Carlson game uh, about six, seven years ago, I think in the same Sinkfield Cup where Caruana went off. There was a, a game in this line, and Carlson knew everything already back then, and it ended in a draw. Anyways, bishop b3 is the most popular move, I think. Queen f6. And as I was explaining, knight takes c6, we play bishop takes c3. Notice that this is the idea of putting the queen on f6. Apart from putting pressure on the knight, f takes c3, d takes c6, black is doing amazing. Um, so queen f6, c3, knight g7, developing, bishop c4, main line, castles, castles. And yeah, checking opening explorer, it says that the most popular move is bishop b6, which I didn't know. Knight e5 is also popular, bishop e2, and now queen g6 with the idea that if white plays f4, you can actually take on e4 and attack the bishop. You can attack the bishop here. Uh, so this would be a blunder. Knight d2, d5 is the main line. This is what I was struggling to remember. And then there's this move. Things get, things get really heated here. It's like position gets incredibly complicated. So you have to know this by heart, which is why I decided uh, not to involve myself with this and play b6. So f4 is a move. And here, indeed, I did not make the main... Yeah, I mentioned... Does anybody re remember what move I mentioned during the game as something that I would consider in a classical game? What is that move that I mentioned? Because we played bishop b7, which is uncommon. d5, yeah. So what the heck is d5? Like, doesn't that just blunder a pawn? Well, if you look more carefully, after e takes d5, black has not one but two viable options. The first, which is what I had in mind, is knight takes d4. Is knight takes d4. Um, and this is the game... Yeah, Vladimir Georgiev had this with black, so a strong player. Or, or even bishop d6, and look at how terrible white's pawns are. This seems to be enough compensation. So after ed knight d4, if bishop d4, you take on d4, you trade queens. 
And I calculate it up until this point. I feel like the d5 pawn is going to be lost. And it's approximately equal. Maybe black is a tiny bit better. Um, but I decided not to play d5 because it took a lot of the life out of the position. You know, it led to a bunch of trades. So we decided on bishop b7. e5, queen h6. I see one game in this position in the database. That is the game. Oh, Muzichuk Stefanova. Muzichuk against Antoinette Stefanova, one of the former, I think, women's number two. Uh, so there's a high-level game in this position. And that game went queen d2. The Stefanova game went queen d2. Black took. Black played knight f5, so like exactly as we did. And here white played knight c3. So I actually think that queen e2 is an inaccuracy precisely because after takes, takes knight f5, black gains a tempo on the d4 pawn. Black gains a tempo on the d4 pawn. And what does that tempo give us? Well, it gives us an opportunity to stabilize the knight on f5, consolidate the situation. If white had played queen d2, we would have done the same thing. Bishop d4, cd knight f5. But here white can safely develop her knight, knight c3. The game continued knight c7. And here, Maria Muzichuk played d5, former women's world champion. And it looks like white is better. Stefanova played d6. Rook a e1. Takes, takes, d, e, f, e. I mean, look at these pawns. This looks real scary. Rook d3. They went into an endgame. And eventually, Maria Muzichuk won. So I would be interested in checking the evaluation with, the, with an engine. But I have a feeling that white is better after queen d2. Note that at this level, this is what the game boils down to. These subtleties. Placement of the queen on one square rather than another, right? Small differences in the way that you develop your pieces. That's what decides the outcome of the game at a 2000 plus level. Knight c3, of course, is an inexcusable blunder at this level. That is a very, very bad move. What should white have done instead? Probably rook d1. Again, if d5, then knight takes e5. Fe5 and queen takes e3 check. Yeah, so this is what we're speculating. But rook d1, I think white is doing okay. We probably would have st played Stefanova's move, knight c7, knight c3. So you get a similar position, but the queen on e2 is somewhat inferior to the queen on d2. Um, but yeah, knight c3 is very anticlimactic. I mean, white just collapses instantly. Even here, at least take on d4 and go queen f2. But you can see very clearly, and we, by the way, would have probably gone c5 to protect the knight. How quickly people collapse, right? You miss a move, boom, another blunder. Knight takes c3, and knight c2, and the game is over. Like, it just took three moves from the moment the white started collapsing for us to win the game. d6, and d takes c5, followed by rook a e8. Not fearing ghosts. If something is defended, then it is defended. Queen f6, heading for d4, preparing h6. Queen d4, and a nice little flourish to end the game. White mouse slip, but rook g7, king h8 is game over anyway. Yeah, rook g8, rook takes g8, rook h7, queen h7. In either case, white is down a million pieces. Is g4, ask Grusky Meerkat, ever a move for white here while you have a knight on f5? Great question. So let's rewind a little bit. Is g4 ever a move? So hypothetically, of course, it is, right? The answer to the question, is it ever a move, is generally going to be yes. It's generally, I can design a situation such that g4 is going to be a good move. Is it going to be good the majority of the time? No, because it's extremely weakening. Obviously, playing it here is a terrible idea because you still give up the d4 pawn. This move occurs with tempo. After rook d1, knight c7, g4 looks better than it did on the previous move, but I still don't like it. Because, for example, look at how weak your kingside pawns are. You have bitten off more than you can chew. And, for example, a simple move that black could make here that could cause annoyance is something like knight g6, piling up on the f4 pawn. You could, hopefully everybody can see that white looks like he's overextended. Maybe not, but this isn't very, very pleasant. Oh, and queen c6, excellent. Oh, excellent catch. Queen c6 actually looks even better for black. You're just infiltrating g2 or h1. With tempo means with a, with a threat, basically. So the the most likely situation in which g4 would be a good move, is probably one in which white keeps the dark squared bishop or maybe has a pawn on d5. But to answer your question, yes, it's something to be considered, of course. All right, guys, I think 
this gives us a good opportunity to round off the stream for tonight. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm going to head to bed. Let's do it, guys. Thank you for hanging out, and I will see y'all tomorrow.